Well, thank you. It is uh, obvious that we've got some networking going on in person, which I think is always better than the technical kind. But we're going to talk a little bit more about that today uh, and look through a different lens at the issues of technology and civic engagement, and that's through uh, political campaigns. And so I'm very excited and grateful to be joined by two real leaders in the field, uh, people who work on political campaigns, looking at ways to uh, drive turnout or do dampen turnout, as the case might be, um, but are using many of the platforms that we're all familiar with to uh, engage and inform voters, albeit from a particular perspective, but that is a lot of what politics is about. It's about making arguments, it's about persuading, and it's about um, engaging citizens with particular messages. And while just about all the other panels uh, that we will be featuring today, uh, I think you've already learned that even those who have a particular political perspective that's not expressed through the platforms that they've created, this is going to be the most partisan panel. Um, and I'm excited about that. <laughs> so uh, first, let me introduce Melissa Ryan to my right. Melissa directs the DC strategy team at Trilogy Interactive, a strategy design and tech firm for political campaigns, nonprofits, and labor unions. For more than a decade, she's been a staple in the progressive movement, leading digital campaigns to raise money and awareness for left of center causes. Melissa has worked on a number of state level and national political campaigns, including President Barack Obama's 2012 reelection campaign. Please welcome Melissa. <laughs> Vince Harris, for the only time in his life, is to my left, is the founder <laughs> and CEO of Harris Interactive. Vince has worked on a number of Republican races and conservative political causes based in Austin. Vince worked on Ted Cruz's first run for U.S. Senate and many other statewide races. This year he's worked uh, both on Rand Paul's uh, campaign, I believe in the PAC specifically, or was it directly on the campaign? On the campaign. On the campaign. Mm -hmm. And uh, Donald Trump's campaign. Please welcome Vince Harris. Uh, in full disclosure, Vince also worked on my ill-fated uh, Secretary of State campaign, but he is not to be blamed for those results. <laughs> I am, after all, a Republican in deep blue California. I was also a consultant for your opponent. Were you? Yes. Oh, wow. Nobody told you that. <laughs> wow. And we were out spent eight to one. <laughs> but you got the LA Times endorsement. I did get the LA Times endorsement. Um, which is why I'm here now as Dean of the School of Public <laughs> Policy. <laughs> um, so I wanted to start with uh, a few questions. This is not going to be a political panel, um, but you're all involved in politics. And so one of the things I think is, uh, might be interesting for the audience to get a sense of is, um, what drew you into this part of mm -hmm. politics? Uh, obviously, this is uh, the work you're doing is, is part politics, part technology. Uh, I know a lot of people in this field come from one of those other perspectives, but <coughs> usually there's a place where they merged. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then finding a way to, in, to work on political campaigns, but specifically through the use of technology is is a growing field, and so maybe Melissa, start with you. What was the what was the the trigger or set of um, reasons why you got in this particular area of, of political campaigns? Uh, it actually started. Uh, I moved to uh, Connecticut and was looking for information about local elections. And I was not getting much from local media, but at the time there was a burgeoning community of local political blogs who were able to give me information about the candidates in my town, help me understand the crazy countyless uh, political system that is Connecticut. Um, and I enjoyed the process so much and I was already active as a political volunteer. I started writing uh, for one of these local blogs from a left perspective, uh, as much to teach myself about politics in my new locale, 
um, as, as to inform others. And I've always been sort of like attracted to both politics and technology. Uh, in 2006, we had this fascinating thing happen in Connecticut, which is uh, Joe Lieberman, who was then the Democratic senator, uh, was challenged in a primary by Ned Lamont. And uh, I, both by being a volunteer in the Lamont campaign, campaign and uh, someone who wrote a lot about Connecticut politics, I was vaulted from person who has 50 readers a week to nationally known political expert on politics <laughs> <laughs> because the, uh, the uh, coverage of this race was insane. Uh, I think I was interviewed by uh, NPR, BBC, Japanese media. And I, I just found that I enjoyed that connection so much of, of helping people uh, using technology to help people either understand the political process better or find ways to get more in involved. Uh, so after that election was over, I decided that I was uh, going to do anything I could to make that my job, the intersection of politics and technology, which combined my two favorite things. Vince. Uh, so first off, thank you, Pete. I do wish you were Secretary of State. I'm sure many <laughs> others do. But, um, and thanks to Pepperdine, it's definitely the prettiest campus, I think, in the entire world that I've certainly ever been to. So if <laughs> anyone can challenge that, please let me know and I will go and visit somewhere else. But this looks, this is just an incredible, incredible campus. So um, I got started, uh, I remember that my dad gave me $20 to build a website on GeoCities, if you all remember what <laughs> GeoCities is. Uh, and I did it. And I got the $20, <coughs> and it sort of incentivized me as a capitalist here to uh, that there could be some money in this building website thing. Uh, I, I taught myself at 14 and 15 how to build websites on Microsoft Publisher. Uh, they were pretty janky looking websites. Uh, but uh, uh, for local elections in Virginia, they did the job. So I sort of taught myself from a political perspective. I, I started volunteering really, really young. I'm not sh exactly sure why. There wasn't a certain issue or anything. I think I maybe didn't have enough friends or something. But uh, so I, I volunteered a lot <coughs> and um, uh, just started building websites. I started a, a blog, similarly here to your story actually, uh, to conservative.com. Uh, T-O-O, conservative.com, and where I grew up in Fairfax, Virginia, the Washington Post, their metro section didn't really cover a lot of local Fairfax politics. So I was this 15, 16-year-old guy who would show up at local county parties, and Fairfax County has 1.3 million people in it. It's larger than a lot of states. So that Republican Party in Fairfax County, there was a lot of people paying attention to what was going on there, and I would blog about what was going on at the county party and local elected officials, they would love seeing their name in print anywhere because the metro section wouldn't cover it and there's no really local papers in Fairfax County. So that's how I got started in politics. One funny story, I'll never forget a man who was a uh, state delegate. I, I uh, this was bad of me, but uh, I overheard him saying something. This was like the gossip blogger of me. I overheard him saying something when I was 16 at the local party, sort of trashing uh, another Republican. And I wrote about it that uh, a night at 16, and I'll never forget uh, the calls I got at like 10 p.m. on a school night. And it was, I had the best excuse ever. My mom picked up the phone said, Vincent has school tomorrow, delegate, insert, insert name here. Uh, he can't talk to you right now. So, <laughs> so that, <coughs> that was a funny story. Um, and my, my a blog sort of led, when I went to school, I went to Baylor University in Waco, Texas. Did you go to Baylor? No. Ken Starr was there, as you all know, from Pepperdine. Um, and uh, at Baylor, actually, Mike Huckabee, who was an unknown man running for president at the time, uh, he couldn't get any media. And he was talking to a lot of bloggers and had just started building a blogger coalition. And I was 18 years old and he asked me if I'd come up and interview him for my too conservative blog. So I did and he offered me a, a job on his presidential campaign and that's sort of how that all occurred. Let's uh, jump up for a second to 15,000 <coughs> feet and just look at the this industry, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. Melissa, you and I were talking before, um, in my private sector life, I worked in advertising and marketing. And one of the things that I think is so unique about the political 
<laughs> consulting campaign space is that in the regular <laughs> advertising world, if a company, if an ad agency loses its account with Ford, it goes for Chevy mm -hmm. or Dodge, right? And if it has some sort of specialization in cars or dishwasher detergent, it doesn't, they don't really care who they work with, right? If they lose one client, they'll go for another. In the political space, it's completely different. There are progressive agencies and there are conservative agencies by and large. And I, I think in part that strikes to kind of why people get involved in this as well and maybe the passion mm -hmm. around some of these issues where people don't have a passion about dishwasher detergent and maybe in the same way. Right. Um, but I wonder if you could speak to just how this field has, has grown in political consulting, especially on this technology side, and, and how it really is bifurcated uh, between, between parties or ideology. Well, I think it's fascinating that Vincent and I, we have very parallel stories into how we got involved in politics. And I feel like that's a truism of the digital space. I've certainly seen it on the left. Uh, I worked for an organization, the New Organizing Institute, for a while, uh, where we trained online organizers. And it was amazing how often, if you go into digital specifically, it generally starts out with some sort of grassroots thing of taking your activism online, becoming aware online, starting an activism online. Um, and at a certain point, I think, for, for me and a bunch of others, it's just like, is this going to continue to be a hobby? or is it going to be my career? But mm -hmm. it's not a career of like, I want to go into digital marketing and make all the money. That might be part of it, but it's not the primary motivation. The primary motivation is to take what you're doing already to the next level and figure out how to make it your career. Vince? So, um, I would say a few things about this. One is that the space has been led by Democrats. Uh, I think that George W. Bush's campaign in 2000 and 2004, I mean, they had a website, they had some people that were doing some sort of digital, but it was truly the Obama campaign, right, in 2008 that sort of created what is the modern field and, and sort of our modern digital agencies. And there's still a talent gap, for sure, between Democrats and Republicans. I'm blessed to live in Austin, where we have some great uh, uh, you know, younger tech talent in the conservative uh, state of Texas, still people that go to UT and Baylor and Texas State that, that I can draw from. Um, but it is hard for Republicans to find uh, people who can work at all levels, right? I mean, there's, there are competitive Senate races all across the country right now that all need digital directors. There was at one point 16 presidential campaigns that all needed digital agencies and digital folks at them. There are congressional races that all need someone to build their website. There are committees that all need digital in-house people. There's not enough Republican people to do it. And I'll never forget a meeting I had with someone on Mitt Romney's campaign in 2012. And it was up in uh, Boston. <coughs> and they asked me, this was about two months to go before the election, they said, do you have anyone that we can hire? I said, what are the qualifications? They said back, I kid you not, Someone with a pulse. <laughs> and that, this, is, this is two months out. This was two election. months out, yes. And they needed young people to get online and to work. And they couldn't find them. They couldn't find them. I don't think the Democrats have that big of a problem as Republicans do. So there's this big discussion now, and Republicans are thinking about how do we invest in young tech folks, because everyone's on Facebook, right? I mean, everyone's on Facebook and everyone's on Snapchat. That doesn't make you an expert on Facebook or Snapchat. That doesn't mean that you know how to target people with a political message. And this is something that, that, that you know, I deal with from a hiring perspective. We have 45 people at our agency. I'd say the average age has to be 24 years old. But, you know, folks, just because you're on Facebook, doesn't mean that you, number one, get the issues and get how to message those issues. Mm -hmm. And number two, there's the advertising component of this. Because I'm not sure about Trilogy, but I mean, my agency, every year that goes by, it's the advertising budgets that get larger and larger and larger. Yeah. And when I started here, we were pretty much running Mike Huckabee's MySpace page, right? And now we're spending multi-millions of dollars in Rob Portman Senate race and Joe Heck Senate race and for issue advocacy groups. So 
the traditional model of the George W. Bush TV folks, that's right. been completely broken. And, um, and directly back to your question, I mean, certainly there's a bifurcated thing here where I cannot work for a Democrat, right? I mean, people are so surprised that are outside of politics. I can't work for one. Would I want to work for one? No, of course not. But, but I also can't because none of my clients would hire me still. Yep, yeah. <laughs> same. So talk about, yeah. So that, that piece as well, that it's not just, it's not just the, the willingness or desire, but what that would mean for future uh, opportunities and, and relationships. If, if, they're, if a particular candidate is looking at Trilogy, they want to make sure that, that you're going to toe a certain line in the same way as, as with Harris. Yeah, I mean, if nothing else, because potentially if we have a client, a client that could be problematic for another client, mm. I think is the, is the biggest thing. Yeah. Um, so if it's you know a candidate on the other side, because then you can tie everything horrible that candidate has said, um, you know, to the current candidate. I mean, there, there's just a lot of um, practical reasons for that. But also, I mean, people who come to work, I assume at Vincent's firm, they really want to help Republicans. And people who come to work at right. Trilogy, they're there because they really want to help Democrats. And if they weren't, there are other firms in the private sector, there are tech companies that are probably a better fit for them. So yeah. let's just, let, I just yeah. want to go back to this this understanding of the, <laughs> the overall advertising and even mm -hmm. the, 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 the tech advertising space. And you had just mentioned, Vince, that these budgets on campaigns are growing significantly. And that's also happening in the regular retail private sector world as well. As far as the use of tools and platforms is, are the political campaigns leading the private sector retail space or is it happening the other way around? So I think that Certainly on the presidential level, if you look at Hillary's campaign, if you look at, I think, some of the types of content <coughs> that we produce for Senator Paul, I think that people in politics are willing to take a lot more risks. I think that people in politics are, and somebody mentioned on the, on the last panel, Facebook, Twitter, Google, Snapchat, yes, they all have people at them that work directly with each presidential campaign mm -hmm. that are generating ideas also from these major tech companies into these large-scale campaigns. So um, we did something for Rand Paul I was extremely proud of. We did a day-long live stream. It was the first time it was ever done. It was kind of like the Truman Show, right, where from when he ate breakfast to when he flew out that, that uh, uh, night, there was a camera on him constantly. Now, in the middle of it, he called the live stream dumbass. Uh, he was kidding. He was kidding, I think. Uh, <laughs> but we capitalized on it. And we sold shirts that said, I watch the dumbass live stream. So you, I, I don't know if they're still up in our store, store.rampaul.com. Uh, but um, A couple left. Right? A couple <laughs> yeah, left. So um, I do think that campaigns are, are leading the traditional consumer space when mm. it comes to testing out ads and when it comes to sort of testing out different kinds of content. Do you have a thought on that? I think the, the biggest struggle I see is getting um, uh, people on, on the Democratic side at least to see digital not, uh, the presidential level they're fine, they've got the scale, but I think we still have a lot of campaign <coughs> managers who see digital as something in addition to or the first thing to cut the budget in ads, which is, uh, if it's an advantage that Republicans have over us, I think their their teams get the, the digital space uh, as far as ads much better than we do. As far as the media mix and how much money to, uh, are devoted yeah, to it. Yeah, because Coca-Cola wouldn't say, oh, well, we've got to spend $10 million less on this campaign, let's cut all of Snapchat or let's cut all of Facebook. Mm. But I, I feel like that happens in the Democratic space a lot. Mm. See, see, I'm encouraged to hear you say that. <laughs> I'm sure you are. <laughs> But um, but I'm also sympathetic because that does happen with us. And I think that the Democratic budgets, especially if you look at like Bernie Sanders and stuff like that, I think your budgets that are getting cut are much larger than, you know, starting than our budgets. I would be surprised when I, I ran Bob McDonald's Governor's Digital in 2009 in Virginia, and we spent 10% of his media buy roughly on digital. I don't think since then I've worked on another campaign that has spent 10% on digital of their total media buy. And that was 2009. So budgets are growing, okay? But so is the amount of money spent on media on these campaigns. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that, that you know, most Republican campaigns, there's this kind of chicken and the egg thing. 
where they know they need to spend money on digital, but they know that this past sort of strategy has worked, and they don't want to be the first. Like there was an right. example last time. This man ran for city council, and he ran on, on one on social media. I bet that that's probably true, but does someone want to risk that running for U.S. Senate when they're an incumbent U.S. senator? Heck no, they, they don't want to risk that. Yep. But should they in the New York, let's say, media market? Where So, so just, just one side example. I worked for Linda McMahon on her Senate race in 2012, the, the owner of World Wrestling. Connecticut. In, in Connecticut, yeah. In Connecticut, one county, Fairfield County, is 50% of the, of the voters, roughly, okay? It's in the New York DMA. One in $10 of spent on New York goes into the Fairfield DMA. She had to spend, it was, I mean, she spent something like $20 million on the New York media market to reach the people she had to in Connecticut. So only $2 million, 10% actually went into Connecticut. Think of the amount of wasted money in some of these markets like mm -hmm. that where you have to be on TV and, and, and there's this bleed into these orphan districts. So it's, it, it is crazy the amount of money wasted Mm -hmm. by folks when they're advertising to these DMAs for... In broadcast media. Di yeah, right. in, in broadcast media. Yeah, and then you have the situation where digital means, well, how do we get the TV ad on <coughs> as much pre-roll as possible without much thought to platform? Mm. I think that's another thing we fight against. And uh, I feel like Facebook and some of the tech companies are doing a good job with outreach and trying to understand that, like, no, you need a 15-second version for Facebook, and maybe it shouldn't just be the ad. Um, you know, maybe it should be for that Facebook audience. We f we fight against that all the time too. That digital is not just putting up the same TV ad on different well, platforms. Uh, uh, so, is that pushback that you're you're getting, uh, understanding that that budgets are growing in this space? But is mm -hmm. that kind of pushback that you're getting more of a, uh, a that <coughs> based on that risk and that thinking of risk, or is it based on a demographic issue of? This is the way we always done it. We've got some 60-year-old cigar chomping political consultant who's making this call. Or is it even coming from the candidate, oftentimes who tends to be older, who may be saying, you know what, let's just let's just keep it on TV and some of these other and direct mail and some of these other places where we know it's work. I mean, I think it's a combination. I think as we have more campaign managers and more people at the party committees who you know, are, have grown up in a more mixed media environment and don't remember time as much before the internet, you'll see that start to change. Um, I also think, I mean, I have a lot of sympathy because you're working particularly at like the Senate level with limited time budget and resources. And you know, mm -hmm. at a certain point you're really sleep deprived and making decisions <laughs> that it's, it's, so, it's so much easier for the consultant to be like, that's a bad decision when we're getting eight hours of sleep a night. Yeah. So I would say a few things back. One is, is that to me it's not almost as much about the media budget as the type of media. So my friend Harry over here does a lot at VidCon. If you all haven't been to VidCon, it's my favorite conference that I've ever been to. It was crazy. I went there. Th you. These 14-year-olds are screaming of YouTube stars in the car. I did not know who the hell they were screaming about. <laughs> Someone walked out as the paparazzi. So it was, it was crazy. And there was, there was a recent study done by Vanity Fair and a professor at USC that younger folks trust YouTube stars more than traditional celebrities Thank like Taylor you. Swift. Okay? Thank you. And, and why, why that's interesting to me in, in politics is because the type of content that we're producing, we're still producing three to five to six TV ads. They all look the same, right? You're a candidate. They look ugly. And then something comes over the screen and ooh, and then it's the end, right? We all know we could all write the ad, right? <laughs> but that's not how people my age Right. And that's not how people online consume content. Because if they see that ad coming up with the ugly person, they click X or they don't watch it or they skip it. People want content that speaks to them. They want content that's entertaining and that's engaging with them. Mm -hmm. So to me, the whole model's broke. Because I get hired, sometimes first, sometimes second. It doesn't matter when I get hired because the TV person a lot of times is still producing right. the ad. Yeah, and yeah. just to your point, then they ask us to shove it online and TV the internet. Yep. But that's not how the internet works. People are looking at cat gifts. People are sharing listicles. They're taking quizzes on what vegetable they are, right? <laughs> that's how people are using the internet. I'm a squash, okay? <laughs> that's how people are using not the a internet. Yeah, not yeah, a squish. No. Melissa, your, your thoughts on that, on, on uh, the fact that 
you know, putting, the, as, as you said, Vince, putting the TV on the internet, that, mm -hmm. that some of the content creation, even if there's an understanding that, yeah, we've got to get into, into digital, it's, it's not really adapting content specifically for right. digital and what, what that's. You know who some of the greatest advocates for it are now? It's candidates because they're just as bored of shooting that TV ad and spending that day shooting that TV ad. So if you're able to give them like, here's here's some crazy things we're going to try and you know, let's spend half a day or two hours filming this and then adapting it for platforms. I find often that if I can just talk to the candidate directly, uh, that's an easier conversation. They're more open than, than their gatekeepers. Hmm. And so, I, and I want to, uh, throw open for for questions as well uh but i just want to drill down on this for a second mm -hmm. the so it, it sounds like in some ways where this field is is evolving is first that first step is understanding what the role of digital media is in the campaign space the second is understanding that we're needing to adapt content specifically for that space that might not be uh created for mass media your, your thoughts on from when you started in this world uh, as the blogger to where you are now, kind of how you've seen that evolution? It, it is amazing. Everything is so packaged and produced now. It's in so many ways. Okay. And again, part of that's because the budgets are bigger. You're yeah. not going to spend $10 million on a terrible video. Um, but it's interesting in the beginning, there was so much like, well, you have no budget, but try this and see what sticks. Uh, a, a candidate caught in a gaffe moment from a tracker could go viral all over the internet and you wouldn't even need so much as an ad. Now mm. it's now it's it's very polished and it's very packaged and I think that's to the detriment of some new emerging, like making a pop on new emerging platforms, particularly I'm thinking about Snapchat, where you want things that are a little under, less produced. Um, and mm. I see, it's amazing, I, I see brands and, and campaigns and they're on Snapchat but it's so overproduced and polished, and it's so different than what I see actual people doing on Snapchat. And I'm interested in seeing how that disconnect evolves. Yeah, so in many ways, the, the media is the message again, right? Mm -hmm. That there's this understanding that, that Snapchat has a certain appearance, and if you come to it with an overproduced piece, it, it stands out in a way that isn't, it doesn't seem real, it's not as connecting. Or I skip it. Yeah. Right. So That's there's a wonderful article uh, by a man named Michael Goldhaber. It's called The Attention Economy. And it talks about essentially that the scarcest resource now with voters is their attention. Mm -hmm. And every day that goes by, there's more websites. Every day that goes by, there's more. I didn't know some of the platforms we were talking about, Line and all this. I didn't know about that. There's more and more and more things every day. Yeah. to look up and to be on. So how do we get somebody's attention when you're a candidate and people can click off and 30% of people are unplugged and everyone's watching Netflix and there's no ads? That to me is what's changed so much. It was easier when I was doing digital on my Cuckabee's campaign. We had a blog and a website and MySpace and the sparkles, right? <laughs> that was easy. Now there's a million platforms. Yeah. There's a million places to reach voters, and every day that goes by, TV becomes less and less important, and this, this fragmented media environment becomes more and more important. And the type of content becomes more and more important. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, a, there's a really cool book that was written before Trump by Lisbeth Van Zoon, and it's called Entertaining the Citizen. It's a really cool book. And it talks about how citizens, guess what? They want to be entertained, or they're not going to pay attention. They're going to move on to sports. They're going to move on to, to entertainment media and Kim Kardashian. And to me, this is what Donald Trump does a fantastic job of. Love him, hate him, whatever. So entertaining. So entertaining. <laughs> you watch everything he says. You watch the debates. You watch what he tweets with the taco bowls and everything, right? Everything he does is entertaining. And he absolutely gets that. And I think that he rode that entertainment and he kicked all of our butts in the Republican primary, right? He kicked 16 people's butts who had perfectly strategized campaigns for six years out, who hired the best consultants, who, who were running all these statistical models and surveys and focus groups constantly because he was more entertaining and because he drowned them out with the earned media that he got from being entertaining. Mm. Dare I ask a question about Trump? 
Sure. She's going to vote for him. She's telling you right now. Um, <laughs> so we've, we've got about 10 minutes, and so I, I, well, I want to leave time for a few questions. But um, although the question on Trump could take those 10 minutes. Um, his, his power, in specifically just in the social media space, mm -hmm. generated, I would guess, mostly by him. I'm sure he's got other people creating content for him. He's the one that tweets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what is that, is, is there any way that that could be replicated without having the, the cultural popularity that he had coming into this race? So I, I want to say first that I, I do not find Donald Trump entertaining, um, <laughs> specifically this week. Um, and I just have to, to get that out of the way. Um, I think that Trump's power is his raw authenticity. Uh, you know, the first campaign training that I ever took, which was, you know, Wellstone so many years ago, and they talk about how authenticity matters so much. No one cares about your five-point plan. They, you know, if they see someone and they like them, they're more likely to vote for them. I think people in, in political and civic engagement struggle with this all the time. Uh, Donald Trump, to his base, comes off <laughs> as very authentic to the point where you've seen his supporters on the news say, it doesn't matter what he stands for, I'm gonna vote for him because I like him, because he's real, because he comes off as authentic. Um, I don't think that's the first time it's happened. I think it's the first time it's happened in this specific way and specifically the communities that he's tapped into mm -hmm. and made, made conversations that were happening on the in internet. I think for a while they've been festering and taking the mainstream. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a lot that we can learn about Donald Trump as a candidate uh, I certainly think there's a lot that candidates can learn about having more unscripted moments. Uh, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what the next iteration is. I think we're going to have a lot of folks on both sides try to be the next Trump. Um, I, don't see we'll have, I don't think we'll have anyone have as much success. And in part, <laughs> would you say that it, it took an outsider, but someone, and we went through a somewhat similar experience with Schwarzenegger here in California, mm, somebody yeah. who just brought such name and uh, cultural awareness uh, to the race itself, that mm -hmm. for a candidate somehow to change gears and try to be more of that kind of person is going to, I mean, it's, it just strikes to that authenticity uh, question. Yeah, I think he, would all, he was also incredibly skilled at being on camera. This is someone who'd been on a TV show for a number of years. And yeah. I mean, I feel like the debates were where Donald Trump, the TV star, really shone through uh, yeah. the Republican debates. Let's throw it out for questions. We have some questions. Uh, yes. Uh, so I wonder if you guys could comment on uh, the social media echo chamber and how that's sort of driving uh, the left and the right apart. And has that been beneficial or a negative for you in your career? So there are two academic terms that are fighting on this, right? One term is called selective exposure, and the other is called incidental exposure. And there have been academic studies that have gone back and forth on what's actually going on. Selective exposure says that we as voters choose what information that reinforces our existing beliefs and that's all we want to see. My company just ran a, a, a uh, statistically significant online study through Google Consumer Surveys that we just got back that, that, that asked if people on Facebook saw that that their friends were commenting negatively about a candidate, about their preferred candidate, what would they do? A lot of people said they'd hide them, and 10% mm -hmm. of people said they would defriend them. Mm -hmm. So that to me reinforces selective exposure model. Incidental exposure says that our society is being helped by social media because our friends don't all agree, and every study pretty much shows that even though that people thought that I'm a conservative, all my friends on Facebook are, every study pretty much debunks that. So that I'm getting incidentally exposed to my Democrat friends and their opinions, and that that's bringing me information I would never see by listening to Fox News or by watching whatever things that I would be categorized as watching Duck Dynasty and going to church, right? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So, so both of these models are competing now, and <coughs> I don't, think that we really have an idea of what's really going on there yet. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think mm -hmm. that uh, from what I've seen, this is where advertising plays a big part. Because it doesn't matter if you're hiding a friend from your feet, I can still shove an ad down your throat. Right. right? I can still force something to show up. Because right now, I hope everyone knows in this room, 
if you gave me your name and your address, or your address, or your phone number, or your email address, right? Melissa and I can both target probably 70% of you on Facebook as soon as you leave here, right? So we can target you individually. That's how you're being targeted. So even though you're interacting with your friends, right, uh, and even if you hide them, we can still advertise to you. Mm -hmm. Melissa? Yeah, I mean, one thing I love about social media is that it gives everyone a voice. Uh, if you have a, a modem or, or a phone, you have a voice. And I think smart campaigns use that. Uh, on the re-election in 2012, we had such an army of people who would go on Twitter and Facebook for us. It was amazing, particularly on debate nights, to the point where we could take over hashtags, we didn't have to ask what was trending. We made it trending. And we were able to, you know, the tweets that reporters <laughs> saw were largely driven by the campaign and surrogates and influencers. Uh, I, I worry about the fact, I mean, I'm both happy about it as a consultant, because selling ads is obviously a big part of my business. Uh, but I, I worry uh, for the user about how much of it has become pay to play. Uh, it makes it a lot harder for small, for individuals and organizations to have an impact. Um, I understand why Facebook and, and Twitter and such have to do that and go to that model because they have to make money. But it's certainly not as, as easy, I think, for a citizen uh, to engage with a campaign or engage with an issue as it was a, a few years ago. And, and one of my grad school professors, her name is Talia Stroud, she wrote a book called Niche News. It's a really cool book uh, that talks about this echo chamber aspect. Mm -hmm. That even on Google, right, when we're searching things and right. based on the link that we click, if we click Breitbart versus if we click, you know, whatever, MSNBC, Google's going to deliver us back more information based on the things that we click. Mm -hmm. So we create our own echo chambers in, in everything we do from an online perspective. And with every click, we're creating a more micro chamber that right. reinforces what we're right. saying. Which can be bad from a civic engage it is bad from a civic engagement from a democracy perspective. Mm -hmm. Couple more questions, Bob. I find it fascinating that neither one of you can work for the other side, but campaign consultants can work for Russian uh, candidates like Yeltsin or British candidates, and there's no backlash, uh, and you still work here. The question I have for you, though, is compared to four years ago, what's the most important innovation you've seen this year? And secondly, is there a and, and Bob, it's an interesting first point. I ran digital for the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, when Obama's people were over there campaigning against us, spending our, our taxpayer dollars against him. So you are correct that, that we can work abroad, but I wanted to get a little dig in there, too. Um, <laughs> so uh, directly to your second point, your actual question, uh, I think live video. And it's, <coughs> it's sexy. But it's also changed with Facebook Live. Before, people talked about live video, Periscope and Meerkat and all these things no one needs to remember anymore. It's all Facebook Live because that's where everyone's mm -hmm. spending all their time. People spend more time on Facebook than they do with their pets, right? Mm -hmm. And everyone is on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So now when people are live streaming things, there's an actual audience. This is where this is all going. It's where it's all going. It's to digital video, live streaming, everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that will also be good for democracy, Bob, because it's not, I think eventually everything isn't going to be perfectly produced. staged, right. yes, produced live streams. It's going to be real. And finally, we're going to get to this place where the expectation is a politician needs to talk to me through Facebook Live, needs to actually, instead of, by the way, how much of a money waster are some of these bus tours that go and they talk to 10 people? Right or 50 people, or to, or to try to force all these people through robocalls. Why not just do a Facebook Live? And then you can promote the Facebook Live to your voter file as it's going on. You can sit anywhere and do that. So I think that's the, that, to me, from a, from a tool tactic perspective, is what's actually new. I would say it's interesting. Live streaming plus Facebook has been a winning combination in terms of audience. And also, um, I think of all the things that have been, particularly in the Black Lives Matter movement, that have been live streamed uh, on Facebook that 
I think have made a, a real impact in that movement that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, live streaming protests really isn't new. Um, I remember in 2011, with the Arab Spring in Egypt and live stream just went constantly. Uh, when I was doing work in 2011 with the labor unions in Wisconsin, we live streamed as much as possible. Uh, it's really taking, putting it on Facebook has taken it away from being a, a niche thing for people who are good at tech because anyone can pull it up on their phone. Mm. Yes, a lot of. I'm curious. I, I want to talk a little bit about user-generated content. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think to me, one of the things that obviously is an opportunity to use these social platforms is, you know, they're not just broadcast mediums; they're two-way mediums, mm -hmm. uh, multi-way mediums where you know, fans of various politicians are often the ones generating memes. And I was thinking about this. I don't remember after the vice presidential debate, Mike Pence made a comment about. Um, uh, based on, you know, someone who is not part of the Clinton campaign, but who is a Mexican-American sharing stories. People were using the hashtag to prison share stories of, right. you know, their hard-won victories to stay in the U.S. Yeah. and be productive, you know, members of our American community. And I noticed that the Hillary campaign actually shouted it out and, like, mm -hmm. gave credit to this guy. And similarly, you know, I'm sure there's examples of that across many campaigns, but I'm always curious, like, from pe for people who've been inside of campaigns, your fans are generating content 24-7. Yeah. You know, clearly, you need to be and it can be random too, right? Who knows who who knows who Ken Bone is? <laughs> I mean, who know who Ken Bone was a week ago? Right? So, so this, out the, you know, your ability to control the messaging in light of user-generated content. So, one thing that I disagreed with or comment on the panel that, that you were on was, uh, James, is James still in the room? Okay, James. Yeah. So, you mentioned uh, that. You had talked to politicians who said, social media, they put stuff out, but they don't get stuff back. I think they don't get stuff back because they're not putting out the right stuff that's engaging and interactive, right? Mm -hmm. So if a politician's saying, here's my freaking press release, no one's going to engage. If they're saying, here, I support the Second Amendment, no one's going to engage. They need to actually ask people their freaking opinion. Social media, not just shoving stuff down people's throats. That's what it's called. So you bring up a wonderful, wonderful point. We used a tool called Ziggio on the Rand Paul campaign, which allows people, and you all that are running all your nonprofits and stuff should look at this tool. I think it's a California-based tool, Z-I-G-G-E. Oh, oh, it is? Cool. It is. Well, your best friend is very smart. <laughs> and it allows users to record videos on whatever platform that they're on and saves the videos on the back of Ziggio. We did this for Rand Paul where we asked people to say why they supported Rand using Ziggio. People recorded videos. We took their videos, made a video, and then post that on social. So we let users crowdsource content. And why aren't, why aren't uh, campaigns crowdsourcing more? We crowdsourced t-shirts for Rand Paul. We let people design the t-shirts that were in the store instead of just shoving an ugly logo or whatever the hell's on it on, on a t-shirt. We let people design them, then vote on them. We got their emails, and then we sold those T-shirts to the people who voted for the, for the one that they wanted. Yeah. And the crowdsourced T-shirts were the most successful ones in our store. Why not crowdsource bumper stickers? Why not crowdsource where people should come to on campaign stops, kind of like Howard Dean did with Meetup? But all these great things have been done in a flash of time, but they're not all... They've never all been culminated. So wonderful question. I don't think there's nearly enough engagement from campaigns still. It's still not just TV and the internet, but just press releasing the internet mm. and shoving stuff. There, there's not reaching out there, by the way. And one thing we tried to do in the Rand Paul campaign, people on YouTube are creating videos constantly saying why they liked Rand Paul, why mm -hmm. they support liberty, why they love the Constitution. We should take those videos and share them. Because not all, not all of the time are, are those folks going to be somehow getting in touch with the campaigns. It's our job to be finding that content and then, right. and then be sharing it. So some of my favorite work uh, involves working with influencers and uh, content creators on campaigns. Uh, it is so much easier to get things shared now. Uh, I remember the first time I wanted a candidate's Twitter account to retweet something. And it was like, oh, well, let's send it to finance for a full vet. Uh, not even kidding. They wanted to vet the person because what if we retweeted the, long, the wrong thing and the person had you know, something on his record that a reporter would make an issue out of? 
thank God this has evolved more um, <laughs> to the point where, you know, on, on the reelect and, and when I was running digital at Emily's List, it's just a much easier process now to work with content creators, to share their stuff, uh, to collaborate with them on what would be helpful. Um, I find so much of the best user generated content on the left starts with a collaboration and a conversation. Just someone on the campaign that has an informal relationship with people who are known to create good content. Um, and some amazing stuff can come out of but, that. I'm so glad that it's evolved. Yeah. It is hard to though, because Rand Paul, one, I mean, why I, one reason I was very happy to leave Ted Cruz land and go to Rand Paul land is that Rand Paul land had a lot of very creative people doing exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And Rand Paul was a unique candidate like that. I could name none of the other people running in that race, none of the other 16 candidates had people who could have designed shirts. They would have all looked and they would have been in paint, okay? <laughs> so I might, that might come back to bite me in the ass, that comment. But, uh, <laughs> but I think that it's true. And, and that goes back to one of the first questions about the difference in the left and the right is if we ask people to design a t-shirt, Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton, they would get freaking the beautifulest millions of t-shirts ever, right? Rand, Rand got good ones, but there was still not nearly as many as people on the left would have. So there's certainly a talent gap in terms of some of these tech mm -hmm. tools, graphic mm -hmm. designers, but it's also developers, a engineers. It's also a perspective, you know, that, dire, that, that desire or willingness to open up. Well, of course. Yeah, 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 of course. Right. I would also say Democrats are, we're good at hiring people who are good at internet, and you particularly see that on the presidential campaign. Um, so if someone is consistently creating a lot of good content, and they want to work in progressive politics, there's probably going to be a job for them. Yeah, yeah. Well, folks, I'm, I know there are more questions. We have a timeline that uh, I'm being cautioned to uh, continue with. Uh, let's give uh, Vince and Melissa a, a round of applause and thank them for their time. I know, uh, Melissa, are you going to be able to stick around? Mm -hmm. So Melissa's going to stick around and be there for the happy hour. Vince actually has to go. There's a debate in Nevada um, that he is running social media for one of the uh, for one of the candidates there. Joe Heck, Joe our Heck. next senator from Nevada. What the heck? What the heck? Um, so uh, our next panel will we will be reconvening back in the Wilburn Auditorium. And uh, again, thanks to Vince and Melissa, and we uh, head back to the auditorium for the next panel.